attention um, a lot more and they'll yep. be like really into sort of getting stuff right and they'll be motivated. Excellent, it's a very good motivator, it gives them the opportunity to really focus without like realising that they are basically. Uh, it's fun for you as well as for them. Uh, good, Kit, anything else about why um, games might be a better option than... Sometimes you can like, you know, the listening, the recording. And they actually know the song and everything. Yeah, good. It will it will demonstrate to you different things. Yes. Yeah. yeah, good. Freya, what else? Why else would doing games be helpful in a Suzuki context? And it like supports their repertoire, so they can't just see like an aspect of the piece, but they can see it elsewhere. Good. So they can get a kind of bigger. I mean, that's not specifically because it's a game, is it? That's just the sort of Suzuki yeah. approach. What is one of the biggest difficulties that we come across in Suzuki? What, what do you mean? Well, what what are the what are the things you spend a lot of your time trying to help with? I, I, the more I say, the more obvious it's going to become. Giving the kids the Review. Yes. Mm. So, so it holds so basic. Yeah, and all of this is tricky often because. Behavior. In where? In the lesson. No. Mostly, I mean, most of you have very good control over your students. At home. At home. Yeah. The parents, the parents have, real have real trouble getting the kids to do what they know you want them to do, don't they? Mm. Practice is hard, yeah? Mm. It's difficult to get your own child to take you seriously in a similar way as they take us seriously. It's an endless frustration for the parents. And so giving them a game is going to be much more likely to be successful. You, probably all of you, but certainly the more experienced of you, will be able to get a student to do something quite boring for quite a long time before they start playing up because you've got natural sense of authority, you're not, you know, a family member of theirs, they want to impress you, you're in a learning situation, you know, they're used to doing that at school, etc. As soon as you take all of that away, and it's the parent and the child at home, like, okay, let's make 10 bone rolls. I don't want to run into the bedroom, right? Whereas if you have set a game for making 10 bone rolls, which could be what, Ted? Uh, for making 10 bone rolls, well, you've got the shaking mate. But so, uh, a game for doing it. Yes. Um, Musical statues, except not statue, you make a bow hold. So the music stops. Good. Excellent. Another way to practice making bow holds but fun. Kit? What are the strategies that we've used in teaching to encourage reticent children to do what you want them to do? <coughs> Stickers. Stickers, Dragon. excellent. You get a sticker once you've done 10. It's not strictly speaking again, but absolutely. Bex? You've got to make bow holds in different parts of the room, like standing on a chair or like standing on the corner. 
Very good. I mean, you can give us a variation on that theme. The other stairs. Yeah, make a bow hold on each step. Exactly right. Maybe. So suppose I'd give them some ownership over how many repetitions they do, get them to throw a dice or, you know, put some numbers up, hide something under a cup, some cups so they have to pick up a cup so there's a bit of excitement. Or, and you could have one saying your choice or something like yeah. that. So they have a bit of... Excellent. You know, Sorry, you don't have to write down all of them. What do I want you to write down? Well, I know them, so I don't want to write down. What's, what's helpful? I think not so much the why a game's helpful, but just what the games actually are. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. Maybe some of the cup game. Uh, for making bow holds. Uh, no, what, well, how would you use the cup game for making 10 bow holds? At home. No. Well, you're allowed because you were <laughs> you were writing. Um, but you know, if you if you live in a flat or you only have three stairs or something, you can do like let's work from here to there. You get a sticker, and every time you make a step, you don't have to do a shake and make. That's a nice one. Um, or you know, you have ten beanie babies, and like let's make a bow hole for. I don't even know what they're called. You know, this teddy or that teddy or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, make one like lying down, make one sitting down, make, make one kneeling down, make one kneeling up, make one standing on one leg, make one standing on the other leg. Like basically just all of the stupid things that you can think of that the children are going to be like, oh yeah, this is suddenly about trying to keep my balance while making a bow hold. Weirdly, it's just a lot more fun than just making a bow hold standing on your mat. Yeah? Um, good. What, um, in terms of like pre-twinkle, so if we kind of think of the most usual kind of problems that people have with getting kids to do what they want them to do, it tends to be when the children are youngest and when they can do the least, yeah? So uh, we might think of one of the children who's been helping us with um, pra teaching practice. Uh, it's got much easier since he is a little bit older and can do a little bit more. Um, but what are some other like key games that you can use with your pre-twinkles? So we've done stuff about how to make bow holds. What else do you need to encourage them to do? High and Lots low. of, sorry? High and low. High and low, excellent. And they will probably like that just because it's kind of a game already in itself. Yeah, the listening game. Good, Freya? Um, Pop goes the weasel. Pop goes the weasel. Um, and how, if, if you have a parent who can't play, what could you, how could you help them to do Pop Goes the Weasel? They can sing it. They can sing it, or? So they were recording. Yeah, they can use YouTube recordings. Um, very good. Uh, what, are the, what are the parts of a pre-twinkle practice that you think, Joe, are probably going to be quite dry and going to need a game to make them more interesting? For the child. Um, like okay, pop, they ready. tend to quite like doing, don't they? Yeah. Um, Getting ready to play. Yeah. Yeah. So, what would you call that? Shoulder position. Mm. But Stop the traffic. Stop the traffic. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So all of <laughs> those same it? games that we've just talked about, you can use for stop the traffic or basically any repetition. Uh, if the parent, if they have marbles, they can collect a marble every time. Um, you know, build a tower, the little puzzle, rubber things, you know, collecting stuff is really useful. Um, if you've got very young ones, those puzzles that are just two pieces can be really great. Like, okay, let's make a bow hold or let's do stop the traffic or let's do busy, busy, stop, stop on E. And then you can find the pair for this, you know, find one pair and you just put them out face up. And then throughout the lesson, they may have made five pairs or six pairs. Um, and all of these things can help you if you have a student that you are struggling to just work with. But a lot of the time, it will be about offering the parent those ideas because you won't struggle with the child, but they may be a lot. And that comes back around to making sure that you're chatting to the parent to actually find out how it is in practice enough so that you understand that's a parent who has trouble getting the child to do anything. This is a parent who just gets on with it and they don't need those kind of ideas or help. Um, 
but they will need support in other areas. Yeah? Make sense? Good. Uh, so, games in group lessons, you can often utilise a sort of, hopefully, healthy sense of competition by doing a game. Uh, I would urge you not always to play games that have a winner or a loser. Um, and I think that the games that have an element of self, um, slightly later on, not pre twinkle so much, but like self uh, assessment are really good. So I think that the kind of classic games for pre twinkle then become a bit different for later on. So let's talk about like classic pre twinkle games. Um, let's go this way, Freya. Favourite pre twinkle game? For a group class, um, can they make bow holes? Yeah, you can just so you can assume that you have some kids who can sort of play twinkle. Rocket song. Rocket song, good. And so, pass the cup. Pass the cup, excellent. So just give us a little bit more detail about how that's going to work. Um, everybody's made a bow hole. You put a cup and one getting in line or in a circle, and you pass the cup from the tip of one bow. Good, and how can you make that slightly more demanding on their musical skills? Um, you pass it to within, uh, on the, so they have to listen to when they pass it or when they shouldn't pass it. Could do, yeah. So you could say, what 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 are you thinking? Um, so if you're um, playing Twinkles, for example, and if you hear. Uh, busy, busy, stop, stop, you pass it to the next person. If not, everybody is um, soaking the whichever twinkle you're playing at the time. Or oh, very good, wonderful. Yeah. So you're playing and you're going to mix up the variations and then they have to listen for a specific one, which means they can set it, give it to the next person. Good. Kit, how would you make it even better for their bow holds, that game of Pass the Cup? Um... What's going to be the problem that you will encounter doing that game with the bow holes? Well, I've just stopped doing it. And yeah. Just thought, well, yeah, their bow holes will just go there. Yeah. yeah, so how can we avoid that while still keeping it fun as a game? Um, maybe like moving the bow from like here and here, and then when they think they're not correct, like bring it down once in a while and they can refresh and bring it up something. I don't know. So we're imagining a bunch of kids like we are right now but standing in closer to each other yeah. in a circle and they've all got their bow bows upright and then yeah. they want to pass the cup around the circle. And the problem is that the the bow holds are going the wrong shape. I'm just not quite sure what you mean that would no, actually no, happen. No, no. It's fine. Um, I guess just, you know, everyone putting their hand under the bow like the rocket song and then just making sure that correct, you know what? Yeah, great. So they could land and check their own bow holes. Yeah, excellent. They could also, Bex, can you think of another variation on the same theme? Um, make sure that they've got a beautiful bow hold just before they accept the cup, so they've got to check the bow hold. Yeah, and excellent. You could cup. say you're only allowed to take the cup once you've got your best bow hold, or, Joe, you're only allowed to Pass it on the bow. give the cup once you get a good bow hold or once you see a good bow hold. Once you yeah. see a good bow hold, yeah. So you have to be quite careful with those kind of dynamics because if you've got someone who's just maybe feeling a bit cross or grumpy or is not like next to someone they really like they may just go like i'm not giving you the cup because that's not a perfect bow hold even if it's a perfectly adequate bow hold so just be careful with the kind of group dynamics of that but i think those combinations of sometimes you have to check and you're in charge is this good enough for you to take and then you have to leave them to it even if you see that it's not great you can't say no 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 you can't take it because you've given them control so you can't take it back um or you've given the next child control, so you're saying, okay, do you think that's a good bow hold? Yes, okay, then take it. Or And you may say, like, do, don't you think it would be even better if it had a curly little finger? Or have you checked the thumb? But not like, no, you can't because it's not good enough yet, obviously. But 
I swear I can't Suzuki. Yeah? Excellent. Um, you could play... Sorry, do you have... Um, um, I, you could sort of play inspectors. Yeah, excellent. excellent. How would you do that? Well, you might choose one child mm -hmm. and they take it in turns to inspect, say if the other is good enough, you know, or... You know, um, or you could be the inspector. Great. Um, I think that's probably better. Yeah. Um, and then, or the the other thing is, if you did it to music, where well, we did it, um, where you stop the music and then is the bow you know, let's check if the one's bow holes, you know. Yeah. So so there's a specific point where they have to freeze. Yeah. So Excellent. that's a, that's another freeze or pass the bow or cut. Yeah. I think it's a similar kind yeah. of idea. Very good. I think inspectors can be really helpful for involving kids who can't do very much. So thinking about your group, Somto could be the inspector with you. So you could be, can you see a bent thumb? Can you see a little finger that is the right shape? You wouldn't be like, okay, Somto, you're now going to be the inspector because mm -hmm. he hasn't had any lessons yet. So he won't really know what a good bow hold's going to look like yet. But to kind of involve like... Um, sometimes smaller siblings, or even older siblings, but siblings who are not playing yet, um, children who are not able to make bow hold yet. I've played the bow hold game with kids who've not even had a lesson and just given them like, you know, a pen and they just hold it upright. I think it's perfectly fine, um, as long as they understand that that's not how they're gonna hold the bow. Um, but you know, it's a nice way to get them uh, involved and it's the same if you're playing a twinkle and you've got a child who can't play on the E yet, you can ask them to go around and look for nice um, level violins or, you know, uh, good anything. feet positions, anything, yeah, exactly. So Inspectors is a really great game um, in almost any group situation for involving children who are not doing, or not able to easily join in with what you're doing for whatever reason. Um, good, I think, um, a lot of pre-twinkle games are sort of a, used as a reward towards the end of the group for having done, you know, some good concentrating. Like in the in the main part of the group, you're not normally going to do a whole pre-twinkle group lesson that is just games because it's you know it's going to be just a bit of like okay, this is the work part. Um, so uh, top games for that reward kind of thing. Anyone who would like to. Sharks. sharks in the water, excellent. Do you all remember how that works? Okay, could you explain? So you put some mats out in the, so they're like little islands, mm -hmm. and then uh, you play something that they're familiar with, something from the repertoire, and you um, make a mis you, you alter it slightly. So not particularly wrong notes, but it might be out of tune or do a slightly different rhythm or something. That's something not, not in. So they have to know it quite well, and then when they hear that, so they're walking around or running around or, or swimming. Swimming. Swim, uh, swimming. 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 That's what it's supposed to be. Fish. Yeah. I yeah. forgot about that. Or yeah. not fish, they're not running. In they're swimming. swimming. They're swimming. That's right. And then when they hear it's not correct, they jump onto the mat because it's like a shark. And scream, and they yes. love that. They do that, yes. 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 <laughs> and and so the thing about it, it about that was <laughs> extremely well described. The thing about sharks in the water is that if I play you, um, you know, imagine you've never heard Allegro. If I play. <laughs> going to know that that's not probably how it goes and everybody is going to scream and go on the mat regardless of whether they're listening but if you play it like this <laughs> then only the ones who are actually listening carefully are going to realize that that is different from how it sounds so you don't want to make it totally obvious because you remove the musical skill part of the game so with any game that you play you also obviously want to be thinking about what that is helping them with in terms of their musical skills or development or awareness or whatever. You don't just want to spend five minutes at the end of the lesson essentially playing a playground game to reward them because they can go outside and play after the lesson and not pay you to just have a nice time doing something completely unrelated. Um, the other thing about Sharks in the Water is it's an excellent opportunity to remind the parents of what? Listening. Listening, Listening what? To the repertoire. Keep going. 
uh, sort of if I say to the group of parents, this game is really great because it makes sure that you're doing your listening, that can be misinterpreted, can't it? Can you give me a really explicit version of what you're going to say? Make sure that you're listening to the book one repertoire every day. Good. All of book one All repertoire book one. every day. Excellent. Because those are the pieces you're going to learn. You don't just want to be looking at, you know, listening to the one piece that you're on at the moment. You want to help. Uh, you know, it improves their musicianship, they will have better sound, they will have better intonation, they will have more musicality, they will know the pieces better because of all of this listening that they're doing, it's like magic practice. I think the phrase listening is like magic practice is a really useful one. Um, so yeah, take the opportunity to kind of point out what the links are between what you're doing and uh, how it's helping the kids. Good. Um, anyone else got classic pre twin thought end of book one games? Hi there. Sorry? Hi there. Yes, we've had that already. Oh. Well done. <laughs> clap the rhythm. Clap the rhythm? You mean don't clap this one back kind of thing? Yeah. And then you ask them if they know it and maybe the rhythm of the twinkle or whatever. Yeah. That's an exercise really, isn't it? Like if you just say, can you tell me which one this is? It's not really a game. You can make it fun by being upbeat and delightful, but it's not really a game. Joe, top games? If you said those are the ones that I would do. Um, Does anyone know Trains? Yeah, the Trains. Yeah. Trains is a really good one, especially yeah. if you've got a big room. With different rhythms. Like here. Yeah, yeah. so if you have, it depends how many kids you have, but let's say you've got 15 children so you may have a train for each twinkle variation and theme they don't have to have the same number of kids in them and they hold on to the child in front's um shoulders and then you will play either on your instrument or on the piano uh, a bunch of different twinkle like the twinkle tune but changing the rhythms all the time and they're supposed to move when they hear their rhythm um and stop when it's someone else's and that can be I was looking up um, quite games yesterday actually, and there was one which was I, I found one which was, is similar, but instead of using twinkle rhythms, they use they have the the A string T and the E string T. Oh yeah, that's so, nice. So they got four. Uh, I was hoping we could we can have a go at this. Yeah. Like, so they've got uh, it's depending obviously how big the glass is, but you could just have the A and the E string. T, yeah. 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 So that they have to move when they hear that string. It doesn't yeah. matter what you're playing on it. Yeah, no, I, nice. thought that, I thought that's a good, a, you know, a good listening game as well. Yeah, really nice. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, things like walk the beat. It's not really a game, but it's quite a fun thing to do. Um, and again, very illuminating. Uh, a little bit later, I would say, probably by the end of book one, it's quite fun to... Um, if you've got an even number of children, uh, get half of them to put their bows away, not away in the cases, but out of the way, and half of them to put their violins out of the way, and then you need to, in fact, let's play this game because it's very easy to misunderstand how to explain it. So, um, bow, violin, bow, violin, bow, violin. Could you get what I've just asked you to get, please? So this is a game to work on the understanding of phrasing and also to have a bit of fun. So violins, you are going to stand still. Find yourself a partner to start off with. Do you want to just come in so you're inside of the chairs? So violins, you're going to stand still and bows, once you hear the end of the phrase that we are on, you are going to move clockwise to the next person. So let's just practice moving. So when you get to the end of the phrase, imagine we've just finished the phrase, please move. Yeah, so you really do need to do this with the kids because otherwise they just like choose another person and then they're all overlapping and it's a complete disaster. Yeah? Uh, so if you are a boa, you want to stand at the right hand shoulder of your partner, if you can. <laughs> Yeah, so that you can get something similar to what you normally do. Yeah. 
on the violin. And then obviously if you've got a bunch of kids who are very different heights, some of them might need to bend down or whatever. And we're going to play um, Aleppo. Oh, I should have Oh, God. <laughs> Ready? Here's your introduction. We'll take it nice and slow. Oh, and the piano floor. Yeah, that's good. Edward, we're not doing this. No, we're not. <laughs> no, no, that's what I said. End of book one, at least. Yeah. Just you couldn't see the communication between them, and at the end of it, they said, "Didn't you ask?" They said, "We did ask, but they didn't ask." But nobody heard any communication. It was really awkward. So the child was standing on the map playing. Playing, but the, so it's all these different maps, and they, they went around to all these different. And like you could hear some of them, they asked, "Is it there?" And they'd say, "No," 
But mm. this one child, the dynamics was there was no communication <laughs> between them, and they couldn't do it, and it was just it just went on forever. Yeah, <laughs> like, I would recommend. It, I would recommend when you play this game that they don't have to move anything to find it. It keeps it nice and quick. Yeah. Um, if you make sure that they can see it, if they go to the right place. I think the mistake there was putting it under under, yeah. under the mat yeah. because also, um, obviously, we started playing louder when, um, um, and the kids they started going in towards <laughs> this child, and she was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. and I think I think she just found it. You know, she Too was much. just like, all these kids were just yeah, it's just you, a bit there overwhelming. Was, there was you know, completely in her boundary. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. And yeah. she was kind of, that, that was definitely the wrong place to put yeah. it. It needs to be put, I don't know. You know yeah, exactly. It's quite good if you kind of tuck yeah. it away somewhere. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm. Good. Um, later on, well, so we've talked about inspectors. I think that can be really helpful. I think being in pairs, like once the children are a bit older, putting them in pairs to look for whatever you're, you know, looking for is a good thing. Uh, if they've all got like violin um, covers, the flag game is useful. Kit, could you explain the flag game for us, please? Um. So, say. I'm the parent trying to see like in a lesson of, with the child and say it's the child and it's playing a twinkle and the parent can hear that there's just a bit of an out of tune note or something he waves the flag and then the kid like corrects it. Exactly. So the flag game, well done, the flag game is basically used for every, anything that you want to draw attention to so that you can avoid either the parent or the child hearing or saying uh, no, that's wrong, it's out of tune, blah, 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 but like, okay, so let's play uh, etude with perfect twos, and if I hear that any of the twos are not are, are not in the right place, if your two is being naughty, I'm going to wave the flag, and if you get to the end of etude, then you get a sticker, or whatever, then you win the game, and if we have to stop, because I've waved the flag, then you have to start again. So it's just a way to focus their attention on one specific thing at a time, and for you to be um, avoiding sort of using words to show that they're not doing something right. Could you play the flag game in a group? Like three twinkles or not really? Um, I think you can, definitely. Well, like they, they're like doing it to you? Yes, you definitely could. It's quite a faff to get them all a flag. You could do the waving game instead. Yeah, yeah. Say, like if you, if you yeah. hear it. Or, you know, like I think another nice thing to do with three twinkles is to get them to listen for something and they have to stand up if they hear it or sit down if they hear it. So if you're talking about developing good intonation, if you have them all sitting down um, and you're gonna play them, you know, maybe an even quite advanced piece, uh, and then if they hear that you're playing a note out of tune, they would stand up and then sit down if you fix it. Um, or standing and sitting, you know, the other way around. Um, that can be quite a nice thing. Give them a little bit of a rest, but also get them you could use the flags for kind of watching the game, couldn't you? So that you know, if they're, they're, they you set them off playing, and then you use a flag to wait to because uh, some of them won't notice because they might be they might be mm. concentrating or something or something to get them to watch you because some uh, to develop the kind of uh, general kind of awareness of general awareness, you know, yeah. Because that's another skill, isn't it? But, um, it's part of being in a group, yeah. isn't it? It's not just being aware of what you're doing, but what everyone else is doing as well. Definitely. They need to be able to watch. Yeah, and yeah. another nice watching game is you need to point your scroll towards the leader. So whether oh, yeah. the leader is going to be you or whether the leader is going to be someone else, right. um, you know, play a simple piece and, and wander around and, and some of them just really don't, like, don't get it. Uh, and so that's quite a fun and useful one because also in many circumstances you need the, your right hand side of the group to be slightly turned towards you. Um, and if they haven't done games like that, they kind of don't really understand. And it checks that they're not just twisting, that they have to actually move their feet to, mm. to follow you. I have a question. With the, the flag game equivalent or whatever, say if you were doing it, mm -hmm. would it be too mean, like, because then obviously there would be, like, the last ones, it would take maybe a while for them, like, you know, once they see the flag is raising, people stop and they, like, give you a wave or whatever. 
and would it be like too mean until like the last person realizes or whatever? Like, it might take a while, or if you know what I mean, friends don't. Yeah, I think you want to. Yes, basically, I think you want to avoid yeah. games where you have a loser. Mm. I think games where you have a winner, like um, so. We'll talk about just a couple more. Um, so uh, yeah, games where you have a winner can be fine. Um, but I think if you if you turn it into that, like the last one out mm. is the loser, then it's it's quite dispiriting for that child. Um, so other really great games once they've got a few more pieces um, under their belts. Uh, review teams, so put your group in two lines facing each other and you can either play it with the whole of both lines being one team or you can play it in pairs and you play a piece and the first person to say what it is uh, gets the point or you say a piece and the first person to stop playing it gets the point. I would recommend if you play this that you get a parent to keep track of the points for each side because it can get quite difficult to, to track it while you're also playing, also working out which person. And then sometimes you will have a draw and you'll need to do another one. Does that make sense to you? Do you want to all just play a very quick version of that so yeah. that you understand? Okay, so let's have two lines facing each other. We'll do the you name it so you don't need your violin. Um, so, no violins. So this is the naming version, but you can imagine the playing version where you would have to play it. Um, okay, so uh, we will have the red team and the blue team, and uh, we'll go in pairs the first time. So Freya and Mimi, you're playing each other, and I'm going to play a piece, and as soon as you know what it is, you have to say what it is, and the first person to get it gets the point. All right? <laughs> First, but you'll yeah, no, she's yeah. first. Let's come in a bit. That's, <laughs> That's a good point for me. Too. The kids are always so close to each other. Well done, one point to the blue team. Right, you know what you're doing? Very good, one point to the red team. And here we have the tiebreaker. Two teams, you know, mostly there's a it can get shouting. It's kind of a bit shouty and chaotic, but it's quite fun. Uh, it, and it's much better for them if you do it the other way around, obviously, where, where you say it and they have to play it. Um, because then they're actually practicing playing, not just naming things. Um, and you can also play that with the parents. Um, in Free Twinkle, you can play with the parents for the twinkle variations, that's quite nice. Um, because what often sorry, what did you call the game? I don't really have names for my games name because I just piece. play them in you the yeah. Name, name that it. piece or play that piece. You name it. I thought that was a good. You name it. That's a very good name. Yes. You name it. That's like my friend who says, "I don't do DIY. I do YDI. You do it." <laughs> <laughs> um, Sounds like a nightmare I, child. I, I, did, I, did, I, did, I did something like that with them. I, mean, I don't think you were there, Ed, but they and they parents shout up. Oh, they know that they know what it sounds like. They just don't know the names of the pieces. Yeah. So then you can say, well, how can you help them learn the names of the pieces? Yeah. Parents. Well, yeah. Because someone parents. will work. Yes, that's what I just. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. They were, the they were, they were, especially um, um, and Angelo's mum was saying, oh, he knows all these, but he just doesn't know the names. And I was thinking, no, he doesn't. <laughs> Well, <laughs> whether he does or not, it's a fair point. I mean, lots of kids know all point, of the yeah. pieces by like, ear, yeah. but not what they're called. Yeah. And so oh, the practical... Oh, the same. <laughs> the, the practical solution to this is very easy with a mobile phone and 20 minutes to sort out you saying May song and just put in the name of each one before each piece. Uh, I do recommend you do that if you don't know which pieces are which. Um, and for the parents you can do that, or just ask them to have a list of the names of the pieces when they're doing their listening. In the Could same you room. That in the group say, well. Oh, this is number six, it must be... What? Could you do that in the group? Play the beginning of some songs and then ask the kids if they know the song, or will that, will that be too advanced? No, absolutely, yeah. Even for Free Twinkle? 
Uh, up to like maybe like May song or whatever, like you know the. What? Ask them to sing the rest of it. No, ask like you play and then they, you ask the kids, does anyone know the song? Or not? As in, have you heard this song before? Yes, definitely. Yeah. As in, could you name this song? Probably not. Mm. Because I don't think most of them learn the names of the songs until they've actually played them. Mm. And some of them never know the names of the songs. Um, but definitely, you can also do a, a song version where you play the first bit. Who can sing the next phrase for me? Ooh. Yeah? Ooh. So, like, oh, I sing, you know. Gold stars. Yeah? Last game to discuss, I'm aware that we're kind of uh, encroaching into um, the next session. Uh, I think that three chances and you're out is a really useful game. I normally call it bang, bang, you're dead. I'm slightly, um, yeah. I have had some people give me feedback that they don't like it. Uh, kids are gruesome, right? They love violence. They do, yeah. Uh, so I maintain that it's fine, but I do think you just need to be aware of it and a bit careful about it. But bang, bang, you're dead is essentially three chances and you're out. And it is up to them. That's very important because you must make allowances for the children who just couldn't cope with the idea of being out first. And even if you see them doing a mistake... Uh, and so therefore they should be out unless you're very sure that it's not going to really put them off or upset them and I think I probably have never questioned it until they're at least in the middle of sort of book two and I know them quite well um, it's got to be them assessing themselves so the game is, let's play um, right, we're going to play perpetual motion with no ease, either on four or opening three of our yep and we are going to play one of my favourite games, which is Bang Bang You're Dead. And that means if you play a 4 or an E, you lose a life, you keep playing, but you go down on one knee. If you play it again, you lose another life, you keep playing, but you put both your knees down. And then, shush, I'm trying to explain here. And then if you... Well, then you won't be able to play the game, Mimi. You'll have to sit out. Uh, if you... Uh, make a third mistake, then you stop playing and you are out. And if you've got a small enough group and they're kind of sensible stroke silly enough, you can say you might want to do a very dramatic kind of death, or you might just sit there. Um, okay, so if you make one mistake, one knee keep playing. If you make another mistake, two knees keep playing. If you make a third mistake, you're dead. And uh, we're not playing E or 4 in perpetual motion. Okay? Good. Excellent. 
Me, uh, sorry, Freya, if you could put that on the, um, uh, Dropbox, that would be really helpful.